Hey everybody. So I want to talk to you guys about um, Act 1, Scene 1 of Hamlet. So, hold on, let me get my camera. There we go. That looks a little bit better. A little bit. Sorry, just trying to get this centered a little bit. Mm, good enough. All right, so, um, Act 1, Scene 1 of Hamlet. And so in this act, um, in this scene, we are introduced right off the bat to the tone. And Shakespeare does a really good job of setting up this dark and eerie tone. Uh, the play begins in Elsinore, which uh, for all intents and purposes is the name of the castle. And it's pitch black. I mean, it's so dark that the guards don't even see one another approaching when it's time for them to uh, change guards, which kind of begs the question, why even have guards if they can't even see more than five feet in front of their face? But whatever. Um, I'm not sure if that's some intentional humor by Shakespeare or if that's just trying to illustrate just how dark uh, the night is, which um, keep in mind that one of the big tenets of Shakespeare's time was how superstitious uh, everybody was and how everything was a sign or an omen of something. So uh, this is Shakespeare trying to rile his audience up into uh, getting spooked. It's a great, uh, scary story for, you know, October. Anyway, so the guards can't even see each other. And Bernardo, one of the guards, enters to relieve Francisco. And as they're talking, uh, two more figures appear. Horatio, who is a scholar and really good friend of Hamlet, and Marcellus. Now, you have three guards and Horatio. You might be wondering, why did the guards bring uh, a scholar with them? Well, to understand that, you need to understand a little bit about Horatio. Horatio, of all the characters in this play, Horatio is probably the most trusted and wise character. He's one of those types of people where even though he's not directly involved, if you want answers to something, he's the kind of guy you go and talk to because if he doesn't know the answer, he can go and find it for you. I mean, he's, he's that good. So they figure uh, if anybody knows what's up, it's Horatio. So they go and find Horatio. And the reason they have him there is because these guards have seen a ghost and they've brought Horatio a trusted and well-respected scholar to basically corroborate their story. They figure people will think that they're just nuts, but if Horatio says there's a ghost, well, then there's probably a ghost. So they bring Horatio and they tell him what's up, and he's like, yeah, whatever, there's no ghost, nothing's going to happen. And just as he's talking, surprise, surprise, the ghost appears. And it freaks everybody out, especially Horatio, who seconds ago was like, there's no such thing as ghosts. So the interesting thing to note about this ghost is that it looks just like their recently deceased king. So this all takes place in Denmark. This is the country of Denmark. And their king, King Hamlet Sr., was recently, well, he was killed, but they don't know that. They think he just recently died of natural causes. Okay, uh, he was found dead in his garden. But the interesting thing about this is that this king ghost looks just like their former king, but he's dressed for battle, which is not where he died. And so they're kind of freaking out a little bit about this. And the guards are freaking out, and they urge Horatio to speak to it. And Horatio shows us a bit more character development by showing us that he's not afraid. He ain't afraid of no ghosts, right? So even though he is kind of quaking in his boots, he tries to talk to it. But the ghost won't speak to him. And it disappears. And Horatio is visibly shaken. And the guards tell him that this is the third time that this ghost has appeared to them. And in each of those times, it refuses to speak to any of them. So Horatio's like, this is not a good sign. There's no way that a ghost dressed for battle appearing in the form of our recently deceased king, there's no way that that's a good sign. And so they all kind of agree. And um, yeah, 
So at this point, uh, Marcellus, one of the guards, takes this opportunity to ask Horatio some questions about what's going on in the country. And again, this kind of goes back to what I was saying about how trusted Horatio is with information. Again, remember, if you want to know something in this kingdom, you talk to Horatio. Um, it's also really important to note that Shakespeare uses Horatio, the character of Horatio, to really serve two main purposes in the play. The first is Horatio, whenever he talks, whenever he's in a scene, he's there to do one of two things. First is he's there to either give exposition, to explain some backstory, which he's about to do here, or to give us some foreshadowing as to what's going to happen in the future of this play. And in both cases, every time Horatio speaks, he's correct. So if Horatio is speaking, you should listen, is what I'm trying to say. And so Marcellus, one of the guards, says, hey, Horatio, why are we gearing up for war? We recently fought and defeated our neighboring country, our neighboring enemy, Norway. We recently defeated them. Why are we gearing up for war again? And Horatio explains really more for the benefit of the audience than the guards um, that what happened was recently Norway and Denmark got in a battle and the king of Denmark, Hamlet, defeated and killed the king of Norway, Fortinbras. And as a result of defeating and killing the king of Norway, uh, Denmark was entitled to a large chunk of land of Norway's as basically a uh, payment. Uh, so they took a large chunk of land away from Norway and it now belongs to Denmark. Well, now that King Hamlet is dead, and King Claudius is now in charge of Denmark, he's worried that the new king of Norway, whose also name is Fortinbras, Fortinbras Jr., is gearing up for war. That Fortinbras Jr. wants to take back the land that his father lost. So King Claudius, the new king of Denmark, is trying to prevent further war, further bloodshed by basically gearing up Denmark's defenses once again. And so as Horatio is saying all of this, the ghost, I'm sorry, let, let me back up real quick. So Marcellus asks three specific questions about the building up of the military. Um, and that is one of your questions and one that you can figure out by reading the story. So I'm not going to answer that question for you, but you can figure it out in that section. So. As they're talking, it's important to note the parallels that Shakespeare is drawing here. See, on the one hand, you've got Denmark, the main country that this is all taking place in, who has Hamlet Sr., the king, and Hamlet Jr., the prince. Hamlet Sr., the king, is dead. He died in his garden. Prince Hamlet, Hamlet Jr., is not the king, but... Uh, he is very much in grieve for his father's death. King Claudius has taken over, his Hamlet's uncle. On the other hand, you have the king of Norway, King Fortinbras Sr., who has died in battle and has been replaced by his son, now King Fortinbras Jr. And so Shakespeare is going to draw a lot of parallels between Hamlet Jr. and Fortinbras Jr., and so from here on out, when I talk about Hamlet or Fortinbras, I'm actually talking about the two young sons of their fathers, Hamlet Jr. and, Ham and Fortinbras Jr. So just keep that in the back of your mind. So anyway, after they're talking, um, the ghost appears again. And this time, uh, Horatio is much more brave. And he orders the ghost to speak. And he asks it three specific questions about what it wants and why it's there. And again, I'm not going to spoil that for you. I'm going to let you read and figure out what those three questions are, because again, that's one of your questions. But um, the ghost, again, won't speak to him. So the ghost turns to leave when the rooster crows, signifying morning has come. 
And Horatio's like, I'm not done with you. And so he orders the guards to try to stop the ghost. Well, they try to stop the ghost. And of course, it's a ghost. They can't. And the ghost leaves. And now they feel kind of dumb for trying to stop a ghost. So they're trying to figure out their next move. And they come up with the idea to tell Hamlet, Hamlet Jr., that the ghost of his father is here and it's roaming around the castle. They figure since the ghost looks like Hamlet's father, if it'll talk to anybody, it'll talk to him. So their plan is to go tell Hamlet that they've seen the ghost of his father and to bring him out on their watch the next evening to try to see if the ghost will talk to him to figure out what the heck this ghost wants. And so that is act one scene one, just kind of setting the stage, setting the tone, setting the stage for all of this, um, and giving us some exposition, some backstory, some of the politics behind what's going on, um, some character development of Horatio, introducing us to some minor characters, the three guards, but really mainly just giving us political backstory, setting up the tone, and giving us introduction to the first major character, Horatio. Okay, so that's Act 1, Scene 1. Please make sure that you've read it, that you've listened to it, and that you've answered the questions in your reading guide. You might notice that your reading guide has some questions that are highlighted in yellow. There's a pretty good chance, we'll call it 100%, that those questions might show up again later on a possible test. So consider this reading guide also doubling as a study guide.